Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the finding and bidding on opportunities with the Government of Canada. It is our absolute pleasure to be having this session with you today, and we are excited to get started. So welcome, my name is Danielle Hofer, and I am the Training and Outreach Officer at Women's Enterprise Centre. Part of my role is to connect with entrepreneurs around the province and ensure that they have the right training and resources to help them succeed. So it's really important that you as our clients let us know what kind of resources you need. Um, just like sessions like this, they come out of requests. So please, uh, in our follow-up email, I'll have my contact details. If there are any key points that you want us to cover, please reach out and let us know. And yes, we are on a Zoom webinar. Lots of people have been on Zoom lately, but if you haven't, this is how to get the most out of today's session. So we have a Q&A function and a chat function. What are the differences? So in the chat, as you can see, people are sharing, they're uh, sharing where they're from and also what kind of city or what kind of business they are operating. That is the best place to use the chat for that ongoing conversation. When you have a specific question though, and you wanna make sure that myself or Aaron get a chance to answer it and we don't lose track, please use the Q&A function. Okay, only presenters will be allowed to see these questions, so we'll be able to interact in, in that type of way. If you have any uh, questions throughout the session, just put them in the Q&A. We'll answer them, maybe we'll pause throughout, but certainly at the very end of the session, we'll have a good pause uh, for lots of questions to be answered. And it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about Women's Enterprise Center. And our organization is a not-for-profit and our passion is to empower women entrepreneurs throughout BC to reach their full potential. And how do we do this? Well, we do have a business loan program. We can lend up to $150,000. Um, in our next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about our COVID relief fund, which is a special program in, in our loans department. We also have professional advice and resources. So if you are stuck at any point along your business journey and want to speak with someone who has that knowledge and experience, that's exactly what our professional business advisors are here to do. We also have skills training. So this webinar is just one of the hundreds of webinars that we have hosted. And especially in COVID season, we have about two to three webinars a week on many different topics. So I encourage you to check out our events calendar to see what we have coming up. We have mentoring programs as well. So we have one-to-one -one mentoring and peer mentoring. If you're wondering if there's peer mentoring available in your city or your region, I encourage you to visit our website at, on the mentoring tab to see which cities are listed. And lastly, we offer a supportive community. So if you belong to say, for example, a women in business group in your city, we want to know about you and what you're doing. Potentially we could deliver a webinar like this or just provide the many resources that we have tailored to women entrepreneurs. And here's some information about our COVID-19 relief. So our special loan program is the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. That is a up to $40,000 loan with up to $10,000 that can be granted and it's interest free um, if your business is um, qualifies for the program. So we are still accepting applications. We encourage you to visit our uh, WEC.ca slash COVID-19 resources page. We also have special business advisory services to tailor to COVID um, affected businesses, as well, lots of other training opportunities. So um, again, encourage you to visit this link on our website. And now on to today's session. So did you know that the Government of Canada purchased between 20 and $25 billion of goods, services, and construction each year? Many of the suppliers of these goods are small businesses. Finding and bidding on opportunities with the federal government 
can provide a fantastic way to grow your business. Get an overview of buyandsell.gc.ca, which offers access to all the Government of Canada's tenders and all the related procurement information. You'll receive guidance on the request for proposal, which is RFP process, and a general information on the government bidding and valuation process. So during this session, you will learn how to search for the government tenders and contract history, keep track of opportunities on buyandsell.gc.ca, and understand the different types of opportunities available. And no better person is here with us to represent these opportunities than Aaron Eidenberg. He is a policy analyst for the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises Pacific. He has done nearly 100 of these sessions and his passion is to help small businesses succeed and to help them sell to the federal government. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Aaron. Thanks so much, Danielle. Um, and yeah, big thanks to Women's Enterprise Center for, for putting this on for us, for, for you know, bringing all of you together today. And, and thanks to you for taking the time out of, uh, you know, what is, what is a pretty busy and crazy time for a lot of people uh, to sit down and, and chat with me today. Um, I got a ton of content, so I, I'd like to just sort of get to it. And we'll try and get through it as quick as we can so I can get to your questions. I've got, I see some great uh, introductions coming in in the chat. So thanks very much for, for introducing your businesses. Um, I see a lot of, you know, bidding about creative services, video, photography, writing. We can talk about that for sure. Some consulting businesses around um, arts-based and creative approaches. Very cool. Um, bike construction programming focused on females. I think I need to give you a call to, to help my wife get over some of her biking fears. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, some great stuff in here that I can, I can definitely uh, tailor some of the, the examples that we talk about today. Um, like I said, I'll try and get through the content as quick as I can. So if you have questions um, or if I go over something you know, too fast and you want to go back into it on detail, throw it into the Q&A like Danielle was saying. That, that's the best place to put your questions and we'll be able to, to address them. And hopefully I get through it in enough time uh that we can you know if, you, if you're okay with it if you're willing to unmute yourself and ask your questions live uh at the end okay so i'll share and here we go let's do a share screen cool okay so All right, so we're talking about funding and bidding on opportunities with the Government of Canada. Danielle, you did a great job uh, setting the table for this, so I'll dive right into it. So I'm with the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises. Uh, we're a branch of Public Services and Procurement Canada. It's our job to support you, to support small businesses through the federal procurement process. We want competition. We want more businesses bidding on, op on these opportunities, and we know that the process itself can be a barrier for small businesses. So our office is a resource for you to try and help you understand that process, get through it as quickly as you can, and uh, really strategically get to a decision about each opportunity, whether this is the right opportunity for your business uh, and how much time to invest on that. Um, we do that yeah, in four ways, lots of engagement, assisting and forming where we're out at seminars like today. We're out uh, you know, giving information, meeting you at trade shows, uh, sitting down with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about how the government buys what it is you sell. Uh, we also have this fourth feature about reducing barriers. That's where we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear about your experience having gone through the federal procurement process, um, and if there was anything specifically in the way uh, uh, that prevents you as a small business from bidding or you as a women-owned business from bidding, uh, where, where possible, we can feed that feedback back to Ottawa, back to policymakers, and potentially uh, influence that policy going forward. Um, so, you know, everything we talk about today, yeah, I've got a lot of examples from the chat that I can sort of pepper in. Um, but if you want to talk about your business specifically, 
shoot me an email, get in touch with us through our, through our generic email box. And one of my colleagues uh, or I would be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about your business specifically. Uh, yeah, Danielle, you did a great job uh, sort of going through what we're going to talk about today. Um, but the big ones, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go to the buy and sell.gc.ca website. Have, have people been there before? Is there some general experience with the website? Um, if not, that's, that's fine too. We'll, we'll show you how to use the website, how to search for tenders, how to find previous tenders and what kind of information about previous contracts is on there. Um, as well as, you know, how to set up some notifications and, um, and feeds for yourself so that you don't have to go back to the website, you know, every day, every week. Um, and then we're going to talk about the formal bidding process. So today's seminar is really, really focused on competitive bidding with the government of Canada. That situation that I'm sure everyone thinks about when they think of government bidding, right? Government business. So we publish a tender on buy and sell.gc.ca. This tender outlines all the requirements of what it is we want to buy and all the rules that, that a business would have to follow in order to participate in that opportunity. How to construct a bid, where and when to submit that bid, everything that must be contained in that bid, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the you know, contracting clauses that you're agreeing to by submitting that bid um, and how we're going to go about evaluating that bid to make a decision about which one of those bidders we're gonna contract with. Now, that's a very important part of government procurement and that's by far the most different, unique process when you're, when you're trying to sell to government. That is totally unlike selling to another business or to a consumer directly. You've got to follow our process. Everything we do is going to be about us being fair, open, transparent. Um, and if you, if you don't follow the process exactly as we lay it out, we have to exclude you. We can't contract with you because that, that it would invalidate the fairness if you don't follow the process uh, the way it's laid out. But that's only one strategy to sell to the government of Canada. And one of the things that we talk about a lot at OSME is defining your strategy. Because the more you can clarify your strategy and the, the, the more efficient you can be with your time. And your time is so valuable as a small business owner. So um, I'll just sort of plug those other two strategies that, are, that I, I sort of like to think about as an overall um, when you're approaching the federal government. Yes, there is bidding. There is the formal bidding process, but we also do low, a lot of uh, purchases through low dollar value procurement and through subcontracting opportunities. And really identifying which one of those three set strategies is, is gonna be the best strategy for your business is one of the first things you wanna do. We're gonna talk in detail today about this bidding process, the formal bidding process, um, but again, I'd encourage you to, to sit down with myself or one of my colleagues and we can talk about what opportunities might be available for you under these other two strategies as well. So these slides are just to say that there are a ton of opportunities available for small businesses. We, we buy $25 billion worth of goods and services every year. By far the vast majority of those contracts are awarded to small businesses. Um, buyandsell.gc.ca is the place where we advertise all of the bidding opportunities. So anything in those in that we're purchasing above certain thresholds. And I'll give you those magic numbers right now that, that define whether it's going to be a, a competitive procurement opportunity or a low dollar value opportunity. And the threshold, the magic numbers are $25,000 for goods and $40,000 for services. It's just been raised in the last year or so. So if, you, if what you're selling, if the contracting opportunities that you're chasing are above those thresholds, you will have to go through this process on buy and sell.gc.ca. When what we're buying is gonna cost more than those thresholds, we will advertise the opportunity on buy and sell. Uh, so let's go and have a quick look at what you can find on buy and sell, including the tenders, 
Um, it's free. There's no registration required to, to see the information that's there. There's no reg registration required to submit a bid. Um, another thing that we do uh, to make it open and fair. Uh, there's filters. You can search for opportunities um, and see a ton of data that's there. There's a ton of open data available as well about past contracts. So you can't just see what we're buying now, but you can see what we've bought in the past, who bought it, how much of it they bought, and who they bought it from. Uh, so yeah, let's go right to the website. And have a quick look around. So here's the website, buyandsell.gc.ca. I saw a couple of people saying in the chat, perhaps, that, uh, that they've been there as well, right on. Um, so this is, this is buyandsell.gc.ca. If there's one thing you do when you leave the seminar today, come here and do a couple different things. And we'll walk through what those things are. So number one, under this For Businesses tab, there is a ton of information under this learn about selling to the government of Canada. They've just redone the website. They've laid it out in, in five steps that sort of mirror the way this seminar runs. Um, but yeah, I really, really encourage you to refresh, go through the material that, that I've talked about today, go through the information that's in there. Uh, but one of the first things you can do, and it's right here below, is to register as a supplier. So you don't need to do this to see any of the information that's on buy and sell, uh, but you do need it to get paid. What you get is your procurement business number, your PBN. You will need your CRA business number in order to complete the registration and your legal business's operating name. It marries with the CRA system. So if you don't you know, type in exactly the way your operating name is registered with CRA, the system will fail. Um, so yeah, register yourself as a supplier. You also uh, get, a, get a first look at some of the language we're using to buy what it is you sell. So there'll be a section when you go through that registration where you pick some commodity codes and you'll see the language that we're using to buy what it is you sell. So yeah, for, for businesses tab, check out the learn about selling to the government of Canada and go in to register as a supplier. You can also search the tenders that are available. Let's just go in and see what we've published today that the government of Canada is looking to buy. And I have, actually haven't looked at this yet today, so it'll be a surprise for me too. So we're buying, we got 30 tenders published today, looking for a financial specialist, printing services, um, okay, so more printing services, a couple different tenders for printing services, a uh, big truck, a heavy logistic vehicle, uh, self-support towers, snow removal. So you can see a wide range of goods and services that we're buying. We really buy just about everything. Let's just look at this snow removal tender as a good example, and we can, we can see what what it is, uh, what you can see right off the bat when you look at one of these tender notices. So first of all, we tell you the status and the days until closing. This is an active tender and you have three weeks and one day to get your bid together and submit it. Remember as well that this one was published today. So if, you, if you're waiting, if you, if you have all your notifications set up and you get, you see this right away, you're a snow removal company in Winnipeg, you've been waiting for this tender and you see this one drop, you have three weeks to, to put your bid together. Obviously that's not a ton of time, especially if this is a surprise and maybe you have a whole schedule of other work that you've already got on your docket. The more work you can do to prepare yourself for when these opportunities do drop and the most time you can give yourself is one of the best things you can do when you're searching. So the reason I say that, don't just wait for an active tender go in and find some past tenders and start thinking about how you would respond to those requirements. Okay, three weeks and one day hence, we tell you when we published it, if there's been any amendments. So far there's none, no surprise, this one was published today. But tenders will be amended. 
And there's a lot of reasons that we do that. Uh, most common is that we extend uh, the day until, you know, we extend the deadline to bid. We do that all the time. Uh, if we haven't got enough bids yet, if people are asking questions that we need to provide answers to, uh, you know, we extend the deadline. Um, yeah, things like that. We tell you some details about it, and I'll just expand this section here. But the most, one of the most important ones here is the GSIN code. Everything we buy on buy and sell.gc.ca is classified under a GSIN code. It's our, it's a goods and services identification number what it stands for. It's our commodity code system. Um, K is a service and then, you know, 113 might be snow related services and then A, you know, when you add the A, so it, the codes build out. Every good starts with an N, for example. Um, IT services all start with D. Just, but the, the point is you want to know what GSIN code you sell. And you might, you know, you might type in snowplow or snow removal and miss it. If we've, if we've published a tender under snowplow and you're searching for snow removal, you might not see it. But if you search under this GSIN code K113A, you'll be sure that you see absolutely every opportunity that's coming out because that's the classification system we're using. We tell you where we're buying it who the end user is, so who the actual buyer is. Um, yeah, our tendering procedure, maybe we're limiting it to just Aboriginal businesses or, or something like that. What trade agreements apply. And here, big, big, big uh, bit of information is the contact point. We will always tell you who you can reach out to on a tender notice. And in this case, Jeremy is the only person you can ask any questions to about this tender opportunity specifically. If you got a question about it, it's got to go to Jeremy um, because he can't, we can't give any information that isn't made public to everyone. So when you ask, if you phone up Jeremy and try and ask him a question about, um, hey, are you willing to accept a bid? Uh, that uses, you know, just, just trucks with snow plows attached. Do you need special snow plows or something like that? If you try and ask Jeremy that question, he'll say, I need this question in writing. So, okay, you, you email him instead, you write out your question. When he answers your question, he won't just be able to answer you directly because then he'd be giving you information that isn't made public to everyone who's interested in this tender. Instead, what he'll do. He'll draft out an answer. He'll have that draft approved. He'll have that approved draft translated into English or into French. And then we'll publish an amendment to this tender that includes your question and Jeremy's answer in English and in French. So you won't even get an email that, that shows you, uh, the, you know, back from Jeremy to say, hey, I've answered your question. So if you're interested in this tender, you're going to want to follow it. You're going to want to make sure you're, you're getting notifications for it. And you can do that with these little icons right here. Any, these show up on a ton of pages on buy and sell as well. They show up on search results. They show up on tender pages. Um, so, you know, if this is, if this is the tender you're in the midst of creating a bid for, set yourself a notification. If instead, you know, you can take this GSIN code, plug that into a search, set filters for yourself for active tender notices, for example, and then, hey, these notifications will appear as well. And you can set a notification for a search result. And then anytime there's a new snow plowing removal tender, you'll get an email for it. You'll be able to check out the requirements to bid. The last thing I'll say about, about what you can see on these pages um, is to point you to the actual formal tender notice, which will always be an attachment in PDF down at the bottom of these pages. This page itself is just sort of the notice page. The formal tender document is always an RFP down at the bottom. You'll see the amendments here as well. This is where they will appear. 
So you see right, right here, it has amendment zero. It's because it's the original tender document in English and in French. This, this is the actual, what becomes the contract. So when you're, when you're trying to get through quickly to decide if you want to bid on an opportunity or not, go right here, go into this document and look at Annex A. This document can be really long. It could be 60 pages of, you know, procurement clauses and bid prep instructions and all this other legal stuff. Read Annex A first, start there. That's the statement of work. That's the contract that's, that's going to be procured. And if that's not work that, that your company specializes in or, or is interested in doing um, or could knock out of the park, then maybe this isn't the right contract for you. But, but start there and get to that decision point as quickly as you can. OK. See a question in here. What is the average number of bids that you receive for a tender? Um, good question. It's really, it's, it's really hard to say what the average number is. It really, really, really depends on the bid. I think the, um, the common situation is that we are looking for more bids. Typically, we want to increase competition and we're looking to try and increase the number of companies that are going to be eligible for and interested in bidding on our contracts. Now that's not always the case, um, particularly during COVID over the last couple months, I know there were some very popular tenders for like face coverings and masks and uh, some of that, some of the, the PPE specifically related to, to COVID. Um, there was a tender couple weeks ago, or I guess in July, in June or July, I think it was published for cloth face coverings and we received almost a thousand bids. Um, so it's all over the place. It really depends on what the industry is uh, and what the opportunity is. But I would say average is under 10 for most things. And Aaron, if I could follow up with a question. So when uh, people are looking through the NXA, is it enough for the business owner to look herself or should she be looking at some specialist like a, a lawyer to help understand? Is it written for the, from the perspective of a business owner? Great, great question. And that's, I think that's exactly what, I'm, what my advice is, is before you get the lawyers involved, go through NXA yourself and see if like that's where it's going to describe the work it's going to say you know uh so for the snow removal services for example let's let's just go right in and look at it so this it's a 28 page document annex a statement of work is is on page 14 so let's go right to that snow removal services so it tells you okay we need snow clearing uh, at, at three different addresses in Winnipeg. Um, so here's all the, there's six different areas. It tells you in pretty good detail here, like even up to how many square meters for some of them, parking lots, rear parking lots, access to a literate liquid nitrogen tank, cool. Um, and then a bit of a schedule. So, okay, between November 1st and 31st. So th this is the information that you would need as a, as a business to, to say, hey, do I have the capacity to do these things? What, would I need to go out and buy new trucks? Um, hire more staff before I could do this? How much would it cost me as a business to, to do these things? And so what would I sort of want to include in my pricing, for example? The lawyer stuff is everything else. If, you, if you've gone through Annex A and you've decided, yep, yeah, this is, this is this is exactly the opportunity I need for my business. That's when you want to get your lawyer to look at all these other contracting clauses that you're agreeing to by submitting a bid. The general clauses and conditions. Go into the, the standard acquisition clauses and conditions manual. Look at our payment terms. Are you going to be able to uh, you know, do all these snow clearing services before you bill us? Because you got to bill us after you've done each day of work. You can't bill us in advance. For goods, you got to bill us after you deliver. If we're buying 3 million masks from you, you've got to be able to deliver those 3 million masks and then send us an invoice. 
and then we'll pay for those masks. The government of Canada does not pay in advance. Um, you know, your insurance, then, you know, are you going to be, be able to meet the insurance requirements? But don't you know, start paying, you know, per diems and, and retainer fees for your lawyers until you've looked at Annex A and decided that this is work your, your company can knock out of the park. Um, and then I see an, uh, a question about um, our opportunities usually granted on lowest bid. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that in detail now as I go through the next the next part of the 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 uh, the PowerPoint. So so I promise I'll get there. The answer is no. Okay, so let's let's look at bidding um, sort of in more detail. So you, you've searched through buy and sell. Uh, you've set up your notifications. You've waited. Patience is a big part about doing business with the government of Canada. You've waited for the right opportunity, and now you've found it. Um, how can you uh, best focus your efforts to increase your, your chances of winning on a bid? So yeah, we're not like other businesses. Um, again, everything we do has to be open fair and transparent. And um, I, I, there's a lot of frustration that comes out of that for businesses. That process for asking questions that I talked about is just a perfect example. We would love to be able to just pick up the phone and give you the technical details uh, to clarify the question that you're asking, but we can't do that um, without making those details available to everyone. That's just, that's just one example of how these you know, responsibilities with openness, fairness, and transparency sort of translate um, into how the process can be frustrating for businesses. We got a ton of laws and regulations that we have to play in. Um, yeah, this is just showing the delegated purchasing authorities. So this is what I was saying. Low dollar value contracts won't have to go through this process. If it's under $25,000, a manager will just have a credit card and they can just buy from you. Um, knowing that you deliver what they, what they want to buy and it's good value. Um, but yeah, we're focused on the, the, not the low dollar value procurement opportunities, but the competitive procurement. And when we're going through competitive procurement, the four types of most common tools we use are what you see here. And this answers Jan, I think it was Jan that was asking that question. This, this is the answer to your question there. So yeah, we do buy things based on low, lowest bid price only, but we're gonna tell you what, what the rules are. And when we're doing that, we're gonna call it an invitation to tender. We generally use that um, tool when, we're buy, when, when, when what we're buying is straightforward. It's an off the shelf good or it's construction. So you know, I wanna buy a MacBook Pro. I don't, I don't need any information from you about why your MacBook Pro is better than your competitor's MacBook Pro. Everybody's selling the same good. I just want to know who can give me the best price on it. Or, you know, I've got these architectural drawings already for a bridge. Uh, you know, we know what materials need to get used. We know all the technical details about the site. We know what code, what building code is for bridges. Uh, you can either build that bridge or you can't. You either have the, the, um, you know, the certifications and the safety requirements in place to be able to, to build that kind of a project or you don't. Give us your bid. Tell us your price about how you can build that bridge uh, and the, the best price is going to win. But that, that's not always what we use. There's a lot of times when we need to incorporate some measure of quality into our overall evaluation. And in those cases, we use an RFP. You might also see it called an NPP or a notice of proposed procurement on buy and sell. And in those, in those cases, there's gonna be some measure of quality along with, uh, along with the mandatory requirements. So there's gonna be point rated criteria included as well. Tell us about your strategy. Tell us about how much experience you have doing these things. Tell us about your work plan for how to go about um, assigning tasks to your team. Um, about splitting up work. 
Uh, tell us about your safety plan. You know, do you, do you have things in place to, to counter risks, identify and eliminate risks uh, or mitigate risks? And all those things will have some sort of point scoring system associated with them and you'll get a technical score to your proposal. Then the technical score will be combined with your price in some formula to give you an overall score. And then the best overall score is the one that wins the bid. Now we're always gonna be transparent about what that formula is to combine those two scores and about how we're awarding points for those scores. So again, this gives you as a business a ton of information about how to focus your efforts when you're preparing your bid. If there's one section that's worth 100 points in the scoring and another section that's only worth five or 10 points in the scoring, well, that tells you what we think is important and where you should be spending your effort in preparing your bid. And then there's also these tools that we use, RFSOs and RFSAs, standing offers and supply arrangements. Um, for everyone who, who was chiming in in the chat and talking about um, being a consultant in software programming, software, uh, software development, this is, this is the, uh, the stuff you wanna really pay attention to. Excuse me. These are the tools that we use when what we buy, we're buying repetitive. We're buying the same things again and again and again. And it does not make sense for us to go to competition every single time we wanna buy um, you know, a leadership development consultant. We wanna buy uh, you know, someone to come in and facilitate some conflict management for one of our teams that isn't working the way it should. Or um, you know, uh, a software designer to come in and build a little app for you know, our, our, our management team to be able to see some data in the right way. In these cases, we use pre-qualified lists. And that's basically what an RFSO or an RFSA create. They're not contracts themselves, but they create the framework for future contracts and they help us uh, buy the same thing repetitively a little more uh, fluidly. So we're always gonna tell you what, what uh, system we're using. If we're not using one of those systems and we're going through non-competitive procurement instead, we can only do that in these four instances. Low dollar value is the most common one. It's not, co not cost effective to compete. Um, we've been doing a lot of these national security exemptions for COVID, for example. So the mask tenders were only open for very short periods of time. That's, that's an exemption from our typical policy because we can't wait 40 days to get some ventilators to, to, uh, you know, to our local health authorities. We, we just aren't doing it. We aren't waiting 40 days to collect bids. No, we need to know now and we need to buy from them now. Same, same situation in pressing emergencies, the wildfires every year. No, we're not waiting to collect bids for caterers to be able to get some food out to the firefighters out. No, no, we're buying from whoever we know that can, that can provide that service right away. Um, or if you have a patent or copyright on, on your, um, on your, good or service specifically, uh, we don't have to go competitive. Um, there's, a, there's this really, it was, uh, it was published on CBC a couple weeks ago, and this is a great example. Um, DFO purchased a fish tube for the big, there's a landslide and big bar that, that blocked the Fraser River and the fish can't, the salmon can't get up it anymore. And so there's, there's one company that has a patent on these uh, fish tubes, pneumatic fish tubes that pick the salmon up uh, before the blockage and shoot them through a little lubricated tube up the couple hundred meters and drop them in the river above the blockage. Um, so, I mean, they're the only company that does this, so we didn't have to go to competition to, uh, to find them. We, we could just contract with them right away. Aaron, it's now a great time to talk about where the under $25,000 items are listed. So they aren't really listed. That's, I mean, I'll, I'll just sort of address it quickly. Um, this, this seminar doesn't focus on those under $25,000 opportunities. Happy to, to sit down with businesses in, in uh, like one-on-one -on -one and talk about where, where the best place to find them are. Um, the short answer is it's, it's a good news, bad news situation if you're chasing low dollar value. Bad news is there is no single place where you can find 
a list of all those opportunities of what we're buying because there isn't one. The good news is the process is going to be more familiar for you. It's going to be more about marketing, client research, finding the clients, finding the buyers and selling directly to them. Um, we do have a few resources that can help you find those clients, buy and sell being one of them, even though, yes, everything we publish on buy and sell is um, competitive and is going through the tender process. Reaching out to those contacts can sometimes be really, really useful to ask what other things they're buying, what other opportunities they may have for low dollar value procurement, because the people who buy snow clearing services for one department probably also buy it for other departments too. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, and also there's a, there's a GC directory as well, which you can use to build a list and find contacts of departments, which might be a buyer for your good or service. So if there's a couple things you can walk away from this seminar with to, to go back and do for your business, number one is go to buy and sell, register your business in SRI, which we talked about. Number two is to search on buy and sell and find that GSIN code that might apply to your business. That's the commodity code. And number three is go to the GC directory, go into the department listing and try and find, see if you can find what departments might be the buyer of your good or service and see if you can find contacts within those departments. Um, so this is, yeah, this is details about the, those types of solicitation documents, which we talked about. ITT is when it's, it's just mandatory criteria and your price is going to win it for you. RFP is where we're going to include some uh, point rated criteria to get a technical score for you as well. And then RFSO, RFSA is when we're buying the same thing again and again and again. Uh, similarities and differences between these. Standing offer is like a catalog. A standing offer is predetermined goods at preset prices. We know what we want to buy. We just want to or make a new order. So, you know, this is what we have for office paper and um, yeah, pen, you know, any sort of office supplies and chairs and furniture and, you know, okay, I, I know how much that chair costs. That one's 250 bucks. It's a contract as soon as I order it out of the catalog. A supply arrangement is a little different, tends to be more for services. Um, it pre, what it is is a pre-qualified list and we can host mini competitions among those. So like consultants and uh, all the IT services generally go through, to, through supply arrangements. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily want to get into a ton of detail about a lot of these slides. Uh, I see there's lots of questions coming in and I want to get to them. Uh, but I want to plug this program specifically before we, uh, before we get to questions. Uh, innovation for defense excellence and security uh, is our innovation program based on challenges issued from the military. So uh, we love promoting this out um, to groups that might not have considered military procurement before, because that is exactly who they're targeting with this program. The stat I really like about this is that coming out of World War II, the government of Canada owned something like 85% of the spend on innovation and research and development in Canada was done like by labs owned by the government. And that, and 15% was private sector. That has completely flipped in 2020. The, the labs actually owned and run by government is only accounting for about 15% of the spend on R&D and the other 85% is being done by private business. And the military wants to make use of that R&D that's going on um, in private business. It's not the, the kinds of challenges that they're issuing through this program are not just, hey, we want better armor and we want better bullets and we want better warships and, and planes and things like that. There are a ton of really cool things um, uh, being issued out through this challenge. There's, there's been some really cool clean tech things about how to manage waste and water and electricity in a deployed camp. Um, there's been some really cool recruitment challenges around, you know, how do we increase women and visible minority representation in our recruitment? Um, 
and there's been some really cool uh, like healthcare challenges and some things to address like PTSD of veterans, for example. So uh, really, yeah, really cool things that aren't necessarily what you would think of uh, from the military. They're looking to fund early stage innovative products and test them in operational settings in the military. Uh, so just check out their website, check out, uh, just search for D&D ideas. Um, we can share their, the link as well um, out with all participants and check out the challenges that are coming. They've got a page for future challenges where they're, they're going to have a round of challenges coming out this fall and, um, and they're, they're starting to advertise what those are. Here's the website right here. Okay. Um, yeah, I can knock off a couple of these questions quickly before, uh, before we go through too many more slides. Um, any other government site bidding sites by sector? Uh, all the federal tenders will come through buy and sell.gc.ca. A lot of industry associations will advertise through Mercs, if you know Mercs. Um, and including Defense Construction Canada. So uh, they don't, Defense Construction Canada tenders don't always appear on buy and sell, but they will be on Mercs. Mercs is a ton of trades work and uh, yeah, construction architectural stuff. Um, there is also a link on buy and sell to all the other government tender sites. So each province has their own tendering site, BC Bid being um, you know, the one here on the West Coast. Uh, but Yukon Territory has one as well, as well as every other province. And there's also links to other governments that Canada has free trade agreements with. Um, yeah, I can absolutely share the GC directory. Yeah, and how can a government uh, business get onto the list of pre-qualified suppliers? So those RFSOs, RFSAs, will need to be uh, bid on through competitive procurement. So there will be a tender on buy and sell that you need to submit a bid for, but that it's not actually a bid for a contract, it's a bid to get you on the pre-qualified list. So you respond to the criteria that we lay out. And that's probably a good segue um, to the next couple slides. Uh, Kathy and Matthias, and um, I see another question about um, women BIPOC or minority uh, specific opportunities geared toward them uh, that I'd like to get into, but I just want to make sure we get through a couple more of the slides. Okay. So, yeah, make sure you're reviewing the solicitation document, all of it. Start in NXA, but before you actually submit your bid, make sure you actually know everything that's in there. Um, if you're uncertain about anything that's in there, ask the question to the contracting authority. We, we were really good at helping out in one-on-ones in general at the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises. We can look at a tender with you, but any technical question will have to go to the contracting authority. And sometimes they have a deadline for those questions that is earlier than the deadline for the tender itself. Um, yeah, six parts plus annexes, all these parts are important. But until you've read Annex A and decided that this is work you want to do, uh, yeah, don't bother with them. We do, a, we do a bid evaluation workshop where we look at what these are in more detail too. Um, I can share the next, I don't know, I don't think we have the next one scheduled right now, but if you're interested in that, just let us know as well. Um, yeah, other possible annexes. This is really where you want to spend your time. These are the questions you need to ask yourself because everything is transparent. So, you know, if we don't say in the tender, this tender notice is set aside for women owned businesses, or, you know, um, there are some socioeconomic considerations in, you know, there's an opportunity to self identify. And in the technical merit, there's an extra 10 points available if you're a BIPOC owned business or an indigenous owned business. Unless you actually see that in the tender notice, unless you actually see that identified as criteria, there's no consideration for that included in the opportunity because everything has to be transparent. So um, the only actual set aside program we use is for uh, indigenous entrepreneurs, for indigenous owned businesses. 
It's called PSAB or the Procurement Strategy for Aboriginal Business. Um, but there has been a ton of attention on women-owned businesses uh, and uh, yeah, black and indigenous people, persons of color uh, owned businesses as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see start seeing more tender notices with similar um, criteria included in them. There's definitely criteria for experience working with those populations when the tender notice is meant to serve those populations. Um, security requirements, all, all I'll say is if there is a security requirement, make sure you reach out early and ask for sponsorship for security clearance. Uh, yeah, make sure you're yeah, collecting information. This is stuff you'll see in the bid if you need to get a sample in, if you need to obtain a sample, if there's a bidders conference that you need to attend, make sure you're aware. Um, and preparing your bid. Whatever format they're asking for, make sure you follow it. it, it Usually we ask for three sections, technical, financial, and certifications. We always want only pricing information in that financial section. Don't include your price anywhere else. Um, and the reason we do this is because the people who evaluate your, your financials are not the same people who evaluate your technical bid. And we don't, again, we don't want that. We don't want ideas about your price influencing how we think about your technical bid. Um, so that's another reason, a, a reason why people get excluded uh, for silly reasons. And just, yeah, make sure you are answering each criteria directly speaking to the, uh, the criteria as they're laid out in the bid. Yeah, these are, these are great things to post up on your wall and make sure you're following when you're creating your bid. Make sure you're meeting all the requirements, detailing how you're gonna meet them. Uh, always reference past projects if you can. They're typically past projects are included as a criteria. We wanna see you have experience. Yeah, show us, show us your, your, um, your management team what experience they have. If you, if you want to include resumes as annexes, just make sure it's very clear uh, where those are and where they can be found and how they meet the criteria. So if we say you've got to have a CFO with five years of experience as CFO, don't just slip the resume in the back and, show and, and have it show, yeah, this person's been a CFO for 20 years without also you know, specifically addressing the criteria. You know, mandatory criteria one, CFO must have five years of experience. Yeah, my CFO, my CFO Danielle, she's been our CFO for 10 years. Her resume is attached. It's in Annex F on page 13 of my bid. Um, and submit your bid. Make sure you know when and where it's due. We're doing a ton of stuff through Canada Post ePost Connect now. Um, so just make sure you're, you're, uh, you know where that needs to be sent um, early and you've created your profile on there. It, if you go on to Canada Post, uh, I think what you need is a personal account. If you go in through a business account, it'll ask you to pay for it. That's not what you need. All you need is the personal account. We have the paid account to be able to receive your bids. You don't need the paid ePost Connect account to be able to submit a bid. Okay. Before I get into bid eval, I know we're, we're getting close on time and I wanna to get to these questions. Okay. So Kathy asks, certified member of Promotional Products Professionals of Canada, do not sell to end user clients, but you sell to distributors. We're committed to enhancing our supply chain with women owned businesses, but you have the distributor in between. How can we promote our company to your end user buyers? Great question. Um, and that's sort of what I hope to see in the future. Instead of set aside contracts for women owned businesses are things like this. Uh, we've called them community benefits plans indigenous benefits plans when they're specifically targeted at um, 
at indigenous communities, but I could see the same things coming in the future to increase our supply chain rep, uh, representation for women owned business, minority owned business, um, and persons with disabilities as well. So what, what these do is make a requirement for that prime contractor, the distributor in your case, to include in their supply chain certain levels of businesses. And if they don't, they're found non-compliant on, the, on their contractual obligations to us. Um, it's a tool that we're getting, it's still new, we're getting better at it, and we're including it in more and more things. Um, but that, yeah, that's speaking to the future of what I hope to see in the future. It, you know, in terms of promoting your own company to end user buyers, unfortunately, those buying decisions are left to the prime contractor. That's the way the management of those contractors contracts work. Um, and, and there isn't much we can do to step in. If, however, there's a barrier there and, and it sounds like, there, you know, this is exactly what I'm saying. We want to hear about in a one-on-one -on -one with you where we can sit down and maybe, maybe explore how, where that barrier is coming up or exactly what's, uh, what's standing in the way. And, and if possible, we can step in and, and influence um, that contract wherever possible. So Kathy, I'd, 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 I'd really like to sit down and, and hear about what you've tried and what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, so yeah, shoot me an email. Um, so new to government procurement, looking at information from past timbers, they often refer to a GOC UID number. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is either, referencing specifications of the product wanted. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I can try and dig in on it if you, if you send me an email. Um, about transparency, who is evaluating those bids? So yeah, let's, let's talk about bid evaluation. Um, recognize we're almost at 11 o'clock. Danielle, is it, is it cool if I go over a little bit? You know, I think that'd be great. And of course, this recording will be available. So if anyone needs to jump off, um, you will be uh, receiving that email. Great. So, so yeah, so who's evaluating your tender? Great question. There's, it's, it's always, we'll say, like a team of representatives of the government of Canada will perform the evaluation. Doesn't tell you much. The language we use is technical authority and contracting authority. My department, PSPC, we're the contracting authority. We're the, we're the overseers of the process. Uh, we're the experts in signing contracts and creating contracts and, and ensuring performance, our vendor performance. The technical authority is the end user. In your language, it's the end user. It's the actual buyer of what it is you're buying. So that, that fish tube example. The contracting authority was, was my colleague at PSPC, the guy actually creating the contract with that company. The end user was, that, was the fisheries management officer, the guy in Fisheries and Oceans Canada, in DFO, whose responsibility it was to ensure that, that uh, salmon are able to get up past that blockage. He's the guy who defined the requirement. He's the guy who would evaluate the technical merits of the bids coming in without seeing the price. Our guys at PSPC, they're the ones who evaluate your price. So the first thing we do when we get your bid is tear it apart. We take apart your, your technical merit and your price. Different people evaluate those two things and together they give us best overall value. We want to ensure best overall value for the taxpayer money that we're spending. So there's a couple different ways we evaluate that. One is with mandatory criteria. When, you, when you're looking at a tender and you see the criteria laid out, we will always tell you whether something is mandatory or point rated. If we don't lay it out really nicely in a table, They'll, they'll make it clear with the language that they use. If they use the word must, it is a mandatory criteria. Anything that's a mandatory criteria is just a checkbox. It's either a yes or a no. Yes, they have a CFO who has five years of experience. Check. If that's the case, it doesn't get you any extra points in the evaluation if your CFO has 20 years of, of experience. All we want to see is that you got five. Check, move on. 
uh, do have you delivered three contracts in the past five years of equal scope? Give us your reference. Tell us a little bit about the project and you know, what was the invoice number? What was the total value of the project? Do you have three in the past five years that are of similar scope? Check, move on. That's all. It's a yes or no. If it says the, the contractor shall do this, or it is preferred that the contractor has these things, these are point rated criteria. This is where we could say, we'd, we'd like a CFO with five years, of, we, you must have a CFO with five years of experience, but it would be good if you had a CFO with more experience. Okay, so you gotta have five years, that's the mandatory but you get an extra point for every year of experience that your CFO has. For example, you get an extra point if you can be very clear about your risk management procedure and what all your staff have to follow to be sure that your scaffold is secure and isn't gonna fall over or you know, whatever it is. Um, strategy principles, methodology, yeah. You know, do you have all these red seal certificates? and maybe that gets you extra points. Um, that's point rated criteria. To actually pick the bidder, we will always use one of these three methods. And again, these will be, no, these will be very transparent, listed right on the tender notice page. Is it lowest price responsive bid? That's an ITT, that's an invitation to tender. That's an off the shelf good or a construction project. It's only going to be mandatory criteria. If you meet all of those mandatory criteria, your bid is responsive. If you don't meet even one of the mandatory criteria, your bid is non-responsive and we don't evaluate it any further. Among all the responsive bids, who's got the best price? That's the one that we contract with. Best overall value, that's when we're including some measure of quality. There's point rated criteria as well. And then we take your, your technical score, we take your price, we combine them in some formula that we tell you how we're gonna combine them. And you get an overall score and the best overall score wins. And this last one we don't use very often, but we do use from time to time. We have a stipulated budget and we just want the best possible solution that's out there. So we only look at your technical score as long as your bid comes in under that stipulated budget. We won't tell you what the stipulated budget is because we know if we do that, we will get a lot of bids at one penny less than that stipulated budget. So this is just an example of how the evaluation can work showing, okay, bid A, company A and B, all submitted compliant bids. They met all of the mandatory requirements. Company C's bid didn't meet the, mandatum, the minimum mandatory requirement on the technical bid. Company D missed the mandatory minimum on the team bid. So these guys were both non-responsive and we stopped evaluating them as soon as they were non-responsive. Company A got a total overall technical score of 91, but their price is a little bit higher as well, you can see. So this is just an, an example. So if we were going with lowest price responsive bid, we would, be con we would be recommending B for contract award here. They were responsive and they have the lowest overall price. One of the formulas we can use is called cost per point. So we just take your overall score and we divide it by your price or other way around. We take your price and we divide it by your overall score. And what we get is uh, a measure of value. Uh, what's it gonna cost us per point of the technical merit of your, score, of your, of your proposal? And you can see in this example, even though company A's price is a little higher, their price per point is actually lower because they have more technical merit to their proposal. So depending on what selection method we use, we can have a different uh, result to exactly the same competition. But of course, we have to be transparent. We have to tell you which method we're gonna use and we can't change that method without allowing everyone the chance to recompete. 
Usually when bids are not responsive, it's because they've missed mandatory requirements. So make sure when you're submitting a bid that you meet all the mandatory requirements. If you don't meet the mandatory requirements, it's not worth submitting your bid anyway. It is simply not worth sending it in in any way and saying, hey, I think I can knock this out of the park, but I don't have three years of experience, even though that's what you've said is mandatory. You can still chase the opportunity, but you need to get that criteria changed transparently. You need to ask the question early, hey, are you willing to accept a bid with two and a half years of experience? Is it, you know, why, why do you need three years of experience? Are you willing to accept something? And maybe the contracting officer is worried about how many bids, maybe they haven't got any bids yet. Maybe they haven't gotten any questions yet and they're worried that they aren't gonna get enough bids. So they're gonna back off that criteria. They're gonna say, okay, we'll make an amendment and we'll say now we only need bids with two years of experience. But if you don't ask the question early and get that criteria changed and submit your bid anyway, there's no way we can accept it. And then debriefing is the last thing in here. Yeah, just make sure you take the debrief meeting, uh, whether or not you were declared non-responsive or um, whether you just didn't win, even if you were responsive. Definitely follow up and approach this meeting as best you can for how to improve your next bid. If you show to this meeting, trying to argue and try and debate what score you should have gotten on your bid, you'll get a lot of defensiveness from the contracting officer. But if you approach it as a collaborate, as a sort of improvement development opportunity for yourself, how can I improve my bid the next time this comes up? They can be really, really helpful. Okay. Just checking the questions here. Hey, I think you got to the, the BPOC question and um, we did talk about searching by sectors using the GSIN numbers, so. Yeah, um, I see a couple of people had to go. So yeah, apologies um, that, I, that I ran a little long. I know everyone's got full schedules these days and usually one Zoom right to the next. So really appreciate um, everybody hanging out a little longer with me. I, I'm fine to hang out a little longer if, if people have questions too. Um, I don't know if, if, do people have the option to raise their hand, Danielle, or request to be unmuted? If they're comfortable, um, um, we're, just, we're just using the, the chat. function, but um, while you're thinking of those questions, I'll do a wrap up if, if uh, you don't have any other slides to share. Sure. So Matthias, yeah, I've just thrown my contact information into the chat. Um, I don't think I have any other. Yeah, just we'll share this, the, the notes from this seminar. These last slides about best practices for bidding are really, really, really useful to look at. Um, and we have a bunch of other seminars available as well. If you're, if you, you know, we went through this stuff a little quickly today, but, uh, we do, we do these blown out, um, in three hours with small business BC every month as well. So look for our, our seminars there, or just, you know, get in touch with me and I'd be happy to, to go through the stuff that's relevant for you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. And just to build off of that, we have done a few sessions with you, Aaron, in the past that we have recordings for. So uh, one in particular that I really uh, think is valuable is the deep dive that you do, the, the expert version of... Uh, the, the bidding evaluate, the bid evaluation workshop. Yeah, that one. Yeah. I, I think it's great. I think uh, we should include in the follow-up email as a, a next step. And if there are any other live sessions with additional updates, uh, we can we can potentially share that as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to do another one of those those deep dives as well. Maybe I know we have another um, math uh, mentor advisory forum with you guys in the next couple months that I don't think we have a topic yet. So uh, if, if you have interest in more of this detail, if you have any, uh, any sections of this that you're interested in more information on, um, uh, or if this bidding evaluation workshop sounds like what you're interested in, let Women's Enterprise Center know and we can, we can set that up for the next session. Or that ideas program, we have a, a lot more information we can share about that as well if that's um, what you're interested in. 
Wonderful. All right. So just to let you know what else we have coming up in the next couple of weeks, we have a financial fitness webinar series um, starting in a couple of days here, build your business. Uh, these are all free. Usually they're $25 each for these series, but due to COVID and the current landscape, you know, we are going to be uh, offering those for free. So highly recommend registering for those. You get a free textbook with it, um, lots of resources. So those are great. Um, and then also we have partnered with the Better Built Business Bureau to talk about how to build back your business with trust. So those are some upcoming free webinars. Also to check out, we've got some mentoring opportunities coming into many uh, different areas around the province uh, to help entrepreneurs get over this really challenging time with peer support. And again, I'd just like to reiterate our thanks to Aaron Eidenberg. He is so knowledgeable about these topics, um, has been able to provide some really tangible next steps for business owners on the line. So I really appreciate you, Aaron, being so dedicated to this work and helping entrepreneurs work with the federal government because there really is so much opportunity. Right, right back at you, Danielle. Uh, thanks a ton for having me. And yeah, uh, I didn't know you guys were doing all these for free right now. So big, big kudos to Women's Enterprise Center. I think that's, that's great work. Wonderful, thank you. All right, and if there are any last questions, let's take that as an opportunity to kind of uh, open it up. Um, let's see the chat. Lots of thanks. So thank you so much for those messages. Um, one interesting, uh, Alan wrote, here's a tip, criteria is a plural noun and singular is criterion. So uh, that's that's kind of interesting. Is that something to watch out for, Aaron? That's, well, that's, he's probably talking about my own grammar. Uh, thanks, Alan. No, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And and that's something to watch in, in tenders as well. We will use that, uh, those words, but like each criterion um, will be laid out individually. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, I'm a grammar nerd too, Alan. I do the same thing to my team all the time. <laughs> Love it. Wonderful. Well, I'm, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So uh, with that, thank you so much everyone for joining us and we look forward to hosting you again. Thanks very much. All right.